Hare Krishna, everyone, and welcome to another session of Prabhupada Memoirs. I'm so honored to have His Holiness Jay Vaita Swami Maharaj here today with us, and where we'll be talking about Srila Prabhupada. And one thing before we start, just want to introduce His Holiness Jay Vaita Swami Maharaj. He's a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, a direct disciple, and he was initiated at in 1968, at the age of 19, and one of his services has been assisting editing nearly all the books of Srila Prabhupada published during Srila Prabhupada's life. And practically the first task assigned to him was to staple booklets. He later went on to typing manuscripts, transcribing Srila Prabhupada's dictations for his books, and then typesetting as well, proofreading, managing the book production, editing, and taking part in the governance of Srila Prabhupada's publishing house. So this is amazing. He's also co-founded the Vrindavan Institute of Higher Education. And he, right now, he has also been serving as a senior editor for free volume translation and commentary for a publication completed in 2005 for Sri Brihat Bhagavad Amrita a 16th century Sanskrit philosophical and uh, devotional work by Srila Sanatan Goswami and by the same author, Sri Krishna Leela Stava, published in 2008. He also served as the senior editor for Srila, Prabhu, Srila Jiva Goswami's Tattva uh, Sandarbha, uh, published in 2013. And I just want everyone to know, apart from these services in publishing, he's traveled the world widely teaching about the philosophy and culture of Krishna consciousness and he has to date taught in over 60 countries. So without further ado, I'm so happy that you are on today, His Holiness Jayadvaita Swami Maharaj. And I'm just wondering, I'm hearing some background noise. Is there uh, something uh, something playing on your side over there? <laughs> I'm just checking. What kind of background noise are you hearing? It's, it's like a whistling noise. It's just gone. Is it gone? It's very quiet. Ah, oh, that's it. I think that's better. It's, it looks, it's a bit better. Welcome. Welcome today. How are you, dear Jade? Not, not dead yet. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was really wondering if we could start, because it's so nice to have you on today. And we've got people from around the world joining us. And I just wanted to start in 1968, at the tender age of 19, you took initiation from Srila Prabhupada. And I'm wondering if you could walk us through that day, how that was, and uh, any realizations that you were having on that aspect, please. Well, the day itself was, uh, I don't know what I can tell you. It was the 26th Second Avenue, Prabhupada's first temple. Prabhupada sat on a, a cushion on, on the floor in the temple room and personally built the fire and chanted the mantras and did everything. Um, he also installed the first Radha Krishna deities in, in his khan, small Radha Krishna, uh, who are now in, in Brooklyn, New York. And married a, uh, two, couple, two, two or three couples. Wow. And so three and cool. initiated initiated three other devotees. Wow. So all happening at a similar time. And now I know what it is. It's the RT going on, which is amazing. So we're all part of it here. So that's fantastic. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see now. Fantastic. I have my earphones on, so I don't hear anything. <laughs> oh, yes. So um, when that initiation, you know, because you would have met Srila Prabhupada a few times, but how was that when you were taking that initiation? Like, I'm, you know, it's so nice to hear from direct disciples of Prabhupada. But how was that, uh, how, you know, how did that feel for yourself at that point? Because there's so much else going on, it sounds like, as well. He was doing the fire sacrifice. He was, he was also conducting weddings. There were some others again. But how was it personally for you? Well, it was, what should I say? 
how was it? <laughs> I think if, if I, I, I really don't know what to tell you about how, how it was. It was um, certainly I think I was, it was above my head. That's the main thing it was. Yes. I, I was quite, what would you say, new and, and I'd only, I, I just joined the temple two months earlier. The, uh, back in those days, you didn't wait a year and then fill out a, a form and, and complete an exam or get recommendations. I'd been there two months, that was good enough. So wow. I was quite new to the process. And, and, and then suddenly you gain initiated, taking these vows, etc., in front mm -hmm. of Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. and, and like in today's society, we people are waiting so many years maybe before even getting any tears, like the mercy there of like, boom, there we are now. Yes. So, it was... uh, it will have, yeah, sorry, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. No, just uh, so uh, as soon as that's happened and the fire sacrifice happened, of course, then we hear that, you know, like you yourself were so involved with the books for Shila Prabhupada, all the services, and even start with stapling the books to help at the start. So I'd love to hear your your recollections and pastimes of especially this aspect. Because today we were talking about Shila Prabhupada and his books. And it seems a big part of your life at the start as well. So please, Maharaj, we'd love to hear some pastimes with Srila Prabhupada now. Well, I don't, well, I got involved in the books. Yes, I was attracted to, to working in that, in that section. Other people were doing other things and I wanted to be close to the books. I, that much I knew. So I, I started out, of course, stapling was, was not a, an ongoing engagement, but really typing was was one of my early services. The most of my association with Srila Prabhupada pertaining to the books was by working on on them. I, I wasn't Prabhupada didn't sit with any of his editors for very long, or his editors, um, no. Uh, what to speak of his typists and, and uh, proofreaders. But it, we were associated with Srila Prabhupada by the service. Sometimes, yes, we, and I put some questions to Prabhupada. I met with Prabhupada, I wrote a few letters. But um, the, the overwhelming majority of the work was done just distantly. And Prabhupada, in fact, uh, wrote in answer to one question, he said, I can depend on you. He said, use your best intelligence, something to that effect. He said, I can depend on you. So that's that's how he did it. You know, he gave he gave you the work and depended on you to uh, to do it. And the Yeah. And sometimes if and it, it was known in ISKCON that Prabhupada didn't want a lot of letters and and you know people writing to him all the time because it, it, as, as we know from email these days it's something of a burden so i didn't write to him very much sometimes i would append a question to um what can i say to somebody else's letter but um But, and I and I wrote a, a, a very few letters to him, and then met with him sometimes, but for the most part, it was just doing it. Yeah, and it's nice that he said he, he just said I depend on you. That's a so that must give a lot of encouragement at the time. Like, like he he seemed to have a, what's that word when we when we're looking at devotees, and when we have somebody that believes in us more than. We may believe in ourselves, and and that's how the empowerment happens. So it's like Shila Prabhupada was amazing in that that he showed that aspect of like I'm depending on you, 
and to do it. So, for the whole society, you know, he depended on his GBC men, his temple presidents, his sannyasis, his everyone. Uh, he couldn't do everything personally, so he did things. He delegated to his his agents, and then depended on them. He, he, no, it's, it's 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 really nice to hear. And and regarding uh, the services, the way like in today's society we have, like you mentioned, we have emails, we have so many things. And in those days, they just had letters, really. And yeah, prob that was Prabhupada's preferred way of doing things. There was telephone. He didn't use it very much. He didn't like it very much. There was uh, telegrams. He he. Um, He used those only for like urgent matters, um, a brief telegram if, if something was truly urgent. Otherwise, he practically ran the whole society by mail. Wow. And um, regarding now, when you were- Which you meant, were by the way, you'd write a letter to India if Prabhupada happened to be in India. And if you wrote, if you sent it to the right place, it would reach after about seven or 10 days. And then it would, coming back another seven or 10 days. So that was the speed of, of things. It wasn't Facebook. And um, regarding- fact, now, now that I'm thinking about it, some, there was something some leaders considered urgent. So someone like flew in to meet with Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada was like, what is this? You know, Prabhupada was, you know, such big men have to fly to, to uh, essentially canvas me for something. He, he considered it, uh, what was the word? Unusual. Wow. His way of doing things was by mail. Mail. And, and that way he was running a whole entire society Everything. by mail. Mm -hmm. That's it. So when when everybody got Shila Prabhupada's letters, it must be because, like you said, like it takes seven to ten days. So it must feel like, oh my God, we got Shila Prabhupada's letter. It must be like such a joyous occasion, um, because of course, like you said, they're trying to minimize how many letters are sent because he's trying. Well, to exciting, not necessarily joy joyous, depending on the topics. <laughs> But exciting, especially at Twenty Six Second Avenue. We'd get a letter from Prabhupada; it would be a big, a big event. Um, it, it was, yes, Prabhupada would write to Brahmananda, Rai Rama, a, a few senior devotees mainly, especially Brahmananda, and so we'd all want to know what Prabhupada said, and we'd all yeah. be in on it. Um, later, of course, he was writing to more devotees, and we were more spread out. So regarding now, when it comes to the books itself, there's these services, all these different services that you were part of, uh, Jade Veta Swami Maharaj, you, you know, from proofreading, taking it all. This service, you know, because people talk about services nowadays, what they want to get involved in, how how did this, because it seemed like it molded, that service started to mold and all the aspects of it you were part of. Um, how How did that come about? Is it? Is it the interest that you had at the start? And or well, Srila Prabhupada just said, you know, we need people to do this. And it's something you took on. And took no, it was, my, it was my interest. I was already, yeah, it was my interest. I, I started out typing. And so from typing, it naturally went to correcting errors that I'd see and uh, so on. So that you'd like engage in that side. Yeah, I just picked it up. I don't... There was nothing particularly that Prabhupada started and, and plugged me into it. At one point he did, when he started the Bhaktivedanta Institute, he wanted an editor there. But um, so he asked me about it and I recommended Dravida, in fact, at the time. Oh, so that's, that's how it, did, it worked. So yeah. regarding now doing the books, you know yourself as well. You you're you're an avid writer. Um, we have the Vanity Karma book that you've also, uh, which I want to talk about later if possible. But regarding books, because it's the basis. Shila Prabhupada says books are the basis, and of course, 
um, in our Krishna conscious movement, there's this aspect of that. We, as a foundation, should be reading all of Srila Prabhupada's books as well. Um, is there something on this that you feel that society today, you know, we need to try and improve on or do uh, to help take that, you know, to the next stage for our development in Krishna consciousness regarding books and Srila Prabhupada's books specifically? Well, the first thing, of course, is to read them. The more we read them, the more <clears throat> we appreciate them and and the more eager we become to share them with with others. So that's the first thing that Prabhupada famously said, they're not just for selling, they're for reading. So read, reading them and really studying them and getting immersed in them, that's for our own benefit, discussing them among ourselves, much jitta, much jitta pran. And then distribute, uh, distributing them. The distributebooks.com is there. Vaisheshika Prabhu is uh, setting such a, uh, helping so much by um, promoting book distribution, explaining book distribution, uh, placing book distribution in the proper context and focus, instructing, offering instructions on how to do book distribution, uh, showing by practical example. So, you know, then this is how it's always been. I've been on more on the production side and others have been more on the distribution side. Uh, and some have spent both sides, but I've been more on the production side. I've distributed books, but more in, in production. And Vaisheshika Prabhu is really the leader in, in, in distribution. He, he's he, talking of Vaisheshika Prabhu. There's an app he's released called uh, Be a Sage, page by page. page. By page. Uh, yes. Um, and and that, that seems to help systematically sh study Srila Prabhupada's books. And you know, when you said about you know you, your production, getting the, the, the volumes out there in the world, uh, like I think we, as, as ISKCON broke some records back in the early days in terms of the amount of books that they printed if I'm correct. Um, I heard there was a massive train with just paper that had been dis uh, brought to the manufacturing plant and where the actual books were made. And it, it broke some records in those days. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, that was the 17 book marathon. So there were 17 books and each one was, I forget what the print runs were, 20,000 or something like that. So um, so it was it was a very large order. And it, it did break records at the time, especially since they were all simultaneous, practically. Prabhupada wanted all 17 books in two months. And those that have to be proofreaded, checked, accepted. Everything, so you the, whole, the whole thing, start to finish, two months. And at that time, we were doing one book every two months. Every two months, we were doing one book, and we thought we were doing pretty well. So then... Prabhupada wanted 17 books in two months. So, so it was, we had to scale up. My God. So how, when you heard that instruction, okay, it's one book, you've been doing two months, that's great. Now I want 17. And how, what was going through the minds at that time of the devotees and yourself? Like, that's well, of course, the, the bomb was dropped on Rameshar, who was the BBT trustee, and Radha Balaba, who was the production manager on um, Prabhupada. I don't remember if Radha Balaba was on that walk, Rameshwar was, and Prabhupada said, you know, 17 books in two months. And he, he that's not possible, Srila Prabhupada. Then impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. Wow. So then Rameshwar saw that Prabhupada was serious about it and, and you know, he wanted it. So Rameshwar, became intense, he's intense by nature. He focused on Prabhupada's instruction and how to fulfill it. So everybody everybody else focused on it and we, we did whatever we had to do. We brought in some new, some extra typists. We brought in, I forget it, we brought in various people to do different things, extra artists perhaps. And we were working around the clock really. Uh, 
any time of the day or night, you could be woken up to proofread a page or to, to do something because we, we were literally working around the clock. And the two months was done, 17 books. Yeah, yeah. And we met I the gathered, deadline. And that we was met the deadline, deadline. yes. You met the deadline, and Srila Prabhupada was notified of this, so he must have been quite happy with... I think uh, the books were personally delivered to him in Vrindavan, if I remember. I think, uh, I think they were personally delivered. So now you've done this 17 book marathon of, you know, reading, proofreading, checking, and it's it's now ready for this. Like you say, you hand it over to the distributors and they're getting on with it. Um, what was then for you yourself, uh, Jared Vaita Swami Maharaj, in terms of the uh, services after those have done, what was the next stage for yourself? The next books. The 17 books, that was just a backlog. Prabhupada was 17 books ahead of us and wanted, you know, wanted the, the, the backlog uh, removed or uh, expedited or whatever you want to say. You wanted to mm -hmm. break the jam. Prioritized. Yeah. Wanted us to break the jam and, and turn those books out. So we did. But that didn't mean it stopped. Then there were more. That went up through fifth canto. The 17 books were mostly Madhulila, Anjulila, Chaitanya Charitamrita, mm. and two volumes of fifth canto. So then there was sixth canto, seventh canto, eighth canto, ninth canto. We didn't run out of work. Prabhupada, and Prabhupada worked fast. The Prabhupada worked very fast. So, you, because we, we see that lovely, you know, dictaphone that Srila Prabhupada used as well, to, you know, when you say he worked fast. So, of course, he's he's speaking. Then you, you said you had typists, etc. So, who was managing that uh, service of, okay, here's the recordings. Now, let's get this done. If you, if you, you know, because it's, it's quite a major feat in terms of well, getting Well, in the beginning... In the beginning, the transcription, that is typing Prabhupada's dictation, was done by almost anyone. Back at 26 Second Avenue, uh, Hayagriva didn't like doing that sort of work, so he didn't do it. But other devotees who could type were doing it. Almost anyone who, who could put his fingers on a typewriter might be engaged for that. Um, and they didn't really have a very good system of doing it. They That machine, the... Uh, we call it a dictaphone. That's actually a, a trademark. It was a, gr a Grundig, um, Grundig recorder and um, or dictating machine. Mm. And the shiny one you see is the newer model. Probably started off with a, an older model. And it, it had for, of course, the, the microphone that you clicked with the controls. But then when you wanted to transcribe it, the there was like a foot pedal so you'd you'd use the foot pedal to start and stop the the machine let's see you'd use this foot pedal to start and stop the machine <clears throat> but the devotees were sitting on the floor you know chairs oh. and tables weren't weren't a thing for us back then so the <laughs> they found it rather awkward, you know, doing it with your knee or whatever. But then one boy, there was a boy named Neil, who was a student at Antioch College, and he joined at 26 Second Avenue for some time as a, like a, a, a participant observer in, in the ISKCON activities. And they asked him if he knew how to type. He said, sure. And uh, he, he regularized things, set up some milk crates and, you know, a, a, a makeshift table and and uh, proper way of doing things. And he transcribed a, a fair amount of Bhagavad Gita as it is. He also went, went back to Antioch, I believe, and made Pancharatna Prabhu a devotee. Oh, yes. Our ISKCON uh, director, online director, Pancharatna Prabhu, who's in Mayapur yes. Dam. Yes. yes. Wow, this Neil Neil Prabhu 
is the <laughs> one that yeah that's it's a, that's amazing so so he this is the person was new came in made made a, a makeshift way of working sorted out quite a lot of the actual typing and getting it done and then he went over to in was it india at the time he went or he, he, america mm-hmm. pancharatna prabhu was there just out of oh, curiosity america america nobody had been to india by that at that time hardly I'm anyone sorry. so he went back to college and pancharatna prabhu was attending college there and um, neil connected pancharatna Later, the transcription was done. Satsurup Marj would probably would send tapes to Satsurup Marj in Boston. Satsurup Marj was transcribing. Uh, then later, Krishna book, I was transcribing. Narayani Dasi, who's in Vrindavan, was transcribing. Uh, Mahamaya Dasi, various devotees were transcribing. And then later, the transcription work was shifted over to Prabhupada's side because sending the tapes back and forth was costly and and mm. slow and unreliable even perhaps although not the tapes seemed to get through pretty regularly but that way Prabhupada had he, it basically after some time he had a team so Pradumna joined Prabhupada his wife Arundhati was transcribing or sometimes um, Narayani was there in, in Mayapur. Uh, she, she would transcribe. So basically Prabhupada had his his editor, his Sanskrit editor and his transcriber uh, right there. And if there were questions about what was what what was on the tape, they could be answered on the spot. Otherwise, sometimes you'd hear something and you you wouldn't know what you were hearing. Yeah. The first of all, you'd hear a word you didn't understand. Is it English? Is it Sanskrit? Is it Bengali? You you have to figure out what language you're hearing. There's a, a famous error in twelfth uh, chapter of Bhagavad Gita, as it is, where it talks about special functions of the pumundi, and that's what was published in in the first edition, and. We questioned it. What is this Pumundi? So when I worked on the second edition, I changed it to, to Punya because pun, Pumundi did, there's no word Pumundi, it's a nonsense word. And then later, Brahma Muhurta from the North European BBT re- reviewed it. What is, what's it supposed to be here? And he had someone look at the Sanskrit in Baladeva Vijayabhushan's commentary. And they saw that the word was Darsha Purnamasi. So Purnamasi means the, uh, the Purnima. So yeah. special functions for the the new moon and, and the, the, the Purnima. So, okay, it's Purnima. But then he gave a presentation and mentioned that at a BBT um, seminar. Rabindra Sroop was there and he, he nailed it that Pumundi must have been full moon day. Ah, Pumundi, Pumunde, Pumunde. So, Pumundi. Wow. so, but the transcriber heard uh, Pumundi. Pumundi. So these were the kind of things that that could happen in transcription. But when the transcriber was present with Srila Prabhupada, that made it a lot easier. Also, the transcribers learned Sanskrit. They learned at least the. Um, the the lippy the 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 pronunciation no the trans the the the, the characters oh they okay the, they learned the Sanskrit characters so they they could read it they could they could read the verses they wouldn't have to uh, go to someone else or guess and when Prabhupada would say something they could look at the commentary also and and see where Prabhupada was coming from I don't know if they did that but they could. But they had Pradumna right there, so they could ask him any question. What's what's this about? What's that about? I remember one time for Krishna book, we wrote a, a letter to Prabhupada. He dictated something. And you know the way when you click on the microphone, sometimes it cuts off sooner than you thought, and the word gets clipped. So there was a word like that, or there, there was a, dis, a discussion. 
and it wasn't clear what what Prabhupada was talking about really it was hard to make sense of this the sentence uh, what is this sentence about uh, the grammar was a little difficult and you know what what is this Prabhupada just wrote on the back of the the letter Yadavari Parishat one word answer Yadavari Parishat that was that's what he wrote uh, the purport of which, in my understanding, was here's the word that I'm explaining, you deal with it. Jayati Janani Vasu. So, Yadu Vari Wow. It's so amazing to hear about uh, Brahmundi, full Brahmundi. moon day. Yes. And, uh, and, and it's just. Because of course, also Shila Prabhupada's accent. It, some people, and how was how was you know? Because when you're transcribing, you go and listen, and that was that. Was there some people not understanding because it got Indian accent? Um, oh, it was hard for the in the early devotees. It was for the early devotees who didn't know um, Bhagavad. They didn't know the philosophy. They didn't know. They were unfamiliar with the verses. They Prabhupada's accent was hard to follow, so there were all sorts of mistakes made, uh, just because they, you know, they did they just wrote down what what made the best sense to them, but it wasn't always right. Uh, later, it was still hard sometimes because you're trying to hear, and we would sometimes pass the earphones around. What's Prabhupada saying among the transcribers? What's what do you hear? Try to get it right. Most of the time, it was you could figure it out, but sometimes it was it was difficult. A word or two, you'd say, "What is that?" Um, and of course, later the, the later transcription was much better because the again the transcribers were right there with with Srila Prabhupada, and plus they were they accustomed to hearing. Uh, uh, yeah, they were. They knew the philosophy. They were accustomed to hearing from Srila Prabhupada. You could almost guess now when you hear like listen to a lecture, you could probably guess most of the time what verse is going to come up next, what what verse Prabhupada's going to cite. Uh, oh wow. Can't you? You hear Prabhupada talking on a topic and you, you can almost uh, guess that okay, now the verse is gonna come up. Janmanam uh Bahunam Janmanamante or whatever it may be, uh, because you're familiar with the subject. But back then That's that's that. So th this is what I find so amazing is that people start like this transcribing service meant that you start to understand Shila Prabhupada more deeply. You're hearing the transcendental voices, and, and it's like it's 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 helping even cleanse us in terms of like you're hearing it directly from him, and then you're putting it in a way so others can hear. Well, read what you put down, which. May have been a very difficult service, but it definitely had. And it's the reason we right now, as second, third generation, are able to pick up a book of Shila Prabhupada and with with not as much trouble read and get that nectar out. Because thanks to disciples such as yourself and the disciples you mentioned, Jayadvaita Swami Maharaj, we can do that. So thank you for that. And I've just had some comments. And this is a questions for... Those that are joining on, if you have any questions that we may have not covered and you would like to ask a question, please feel free. Um, I'll check it out and then where possible, we will try and put it on. I've just seen some uh, nice points coming up, Maharaj, which I wanted to just one person say, interesting topic. They're quite liking this topic because I think the technicalities of how the books get out there, how it happens, is very interesting, important that we understand how that happened so i'm only skimming the surface sometime i should do a seminar on how the books were were actually produced i think i think that would be fantastic uh how 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 is it produced how did i make it actually just bringing on to that since you did you know you did mention at the start one book two months but and that was really like pushing and then you have to do 17 books in two months so just regarding that process, if you don't mind, just an overlying process. So everybody here understands now we've got internet, we've got all these things happening. But in those days, from conception, 
the process is needed for that book to go through to the end where uh, we can see it. And also, I just want to put Malini Priti Devi Dasi said, yes, Maharaj, we would like to join the seminar. So hopefully there will be, this is this is hopefully spurring that on. So, but if you don't mind, uh, His Holiness Jayavadvaita Swami Maharaj, if you could, just so we get the idea for those that don't know this process. Well, of course, Prabhupada would, as you know, um, well, first, actually, at the beginning of the process, Prabhupada would type with two fingers on an, on an old typewriter. So the, the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, as it is, for example, and first canto and second canto, they were all done that way, Prabhupada typing with two fingers on a typewriter. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Then sometime in, must have been 1967, I think, Gargamuni Prabhu was passing by a store and he in, in New York City and he saw a, a, this Grundig dictating machine and he thought, I bet Swamiji could use that for his books. And he said, you know, he, he wasn't the kind of person who would just like seize on something and go buy it, but he somehow or other, he thought that Swamiji could use this. So he went into the store, he talked to the guy, the guy um, sold him the, the thing. And then, you know, carefully went through it with him, how to use it, walking him through the whole whole business. And then he brought it back to Prabhupada and uh, Prabhupada liked it. He's, Gargamuni was going to show him how to use it. It seemed like Prabhupada already knew everything, Gargamuni said. He uh, at once knew how to use it. Then from there on, that's how Prabhupada wrote. He wrote by dictation. Wow. The And of course, he would refer to the commentaries of the previous acharyas. Uh, he wasn't just writing from inspiration only, but from inspiration and the, the words of the previous acharyas. When we had questions after a while, we learned that if we have a question about something, send the relevant section from the commentary also so that Prabhupada could refer to it. Uh, Otherwise, sometimes he'd write back, he said, I don't have the books with me. Um, but uh, so, yes, he would refer to the Acharyas, uh, sometimes many Acharyas for Bhagavatam, and uh, think very carefully about what he wanted to present and dictate, uh, as you know, at night, mainly. So, then it would be transcribed. I've already talked about that. Um, we have a picture of the transcribing machine someplace, the older one. I, I don't have it readily available on, on my hard disk. It's somewhere, but it's, we have, have published it. So transcription would go on first. And I, I've talked about how that was going. After transcription, then the Sanskrit editing and English editing. Sanskrit, his, his original Sanskrit editor was Pradumna. Prabhupada had him learn the, the Sanskrit alphabet and then learn the system of transliteration. TLC, the first book, was done just phonetic pronunciation, not with the diacritic system. And of course, first canto in India, Prabhupada did the same way. But after that, Prabhupada wanted this scholarly system. He engaged Pradumna, and Pradumna went on from there to become an accomplished Sanskrit scholar. So Pradumna, Prabhupada called him Pantaji, would do Pandit. all the, he would do the Sanskrit editing. And then it would come to the English editors. For the books, the Bhagavad Gita as it is, first, the, anyone who knew English was editing it. Brahmananda, I did an interview with him, he said, you know, uh, he would come to me, it would come to Haigiva, it would come to such, it would come to anyone, anyone who, who knew English, we'd sort of take a shot at it. But then it, it became regular. The editor's main editor was Haigiva Prabhu, and at another stage, Re Ramadas. Uh, they were the two editors for Bhagavad Gita as it is. Then for other books, uh, Satsurup Maharaj was involved in, in First Canto and Krishna Book. Uh, 
sorry, first, second, uh, third canto and Krishna book. Then Satsurup Maharaj sort of dropped off as as uh, a book editor. He, he became the editor for BTG and he had his Boston Temple president, many other services, GBC. Uh, so then the editing came down to Hayagriva and me. And at some point, um, Hayagriva dropped off. And then he, he got on board again for Madhulila and Hanchilila. But otherwise, from the second half of fourth canto, no, I did, I did the beginning of fourth canto. Anyway, I did a lot of editing and, and six, seven, eight, nine, and and Prabhupada's portion of ten. I did the the English editing for that. The after the books were edited, then. <clears throat> Then you came to, and of course, typing, uh, editing meant retyping. So st- we'd have oh. typists who would retype things. And then um, composition. Composition means t- what we call typesetting. Th- at, in the beginning, or actually until that, just about until the time of seventeenth, the 17th book marathon, we had no computers were involved at all. Computers were not yet a desktop item, um, and they were not involved. Everything up through fourth canto was typeset on an old machine called an IBM Composer. I may have a picture of that for you. Let's just see. Um, Yes, you can share it to the screen. Uh, Let's see what I've got for you. Um, Documents. Mm-hmm. IBM type composer. Try and IBM composer was a, a five thousand um, dollar, very sophisticated machine. And let's see, let's see, let's see. Hold on, let's see what I've got for you. Oh. And while you're finding that, uh, Chaya Patel, she says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, it's vital we have it documented how these books were compiled. So it's great that we're doing this today um, so people can understand the, the, the process. No computers, everyone. I, I gather you heard that as well. No computers. <laughs> okay, I have a video. Let's see if it works. Um, okay. If you just share screen, you can do it, Maharaj, and I can put yeah, it. You might not have the it. sound. First, I'll see if I can get it open. So while we just have that coming on, can you suggest? And we've got a really good question coming on reading, which we'll we'll come on to as well. Um, after we've seen this process, just those, so stick in there, everybody. This is uh, some fresh info you're getting. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Now, okay, it's coming up. I'm just going to put it on. Add to stream. Oh, that's your IBM Selectric Composer, and um, you can see it, before that, typewriters had these little bars. When you hit the keys this little bar with the letter would come up, but IBM innovated this little golf ball that you see, which spun this around. This one on the right-hand side. On the left-hand right, side. Left-hand side. Uh, oh, on, yes. On the okay, paper itself, that little golf ball, which you could change. So you could have italic type, Roman type, you could, by changing the balls. Ah. Um, and so that, was, that became the standard for office typewriters in the late 1960s and early 70s. And then, one up from this was this machine. The typewriter was a, a standard office machine. This was a more sophisticated machine that let you justify columns. That is to say, make the columns come out even on the right side instead of being um, consisting of lines of different length. And uh, well, let's see. Let's show you the video. Okay. Yeah. If you press the play on that. Yes. Let's see. 
so we may we may not hear sound but um you can everyone can see how it's working so it's got this little red dial uh, as they're moving as well uh jade Vaita swami maharaj is that just showing whereabouts you are like a measuring so you can make it exact that amount the um the little red arrow yeah. shows where yeah. you are and the little color display that the man is pointing to uh, changes as you go along it basically indicates how how close you are to the right hand margin that you've set uh -huh. and your goal is to come as close as you can um of course uh, so that the you won't have uh, it big spaces even. between the words so then you take a reading at when you reach the end of the line and then you set that reading will be something like blue four or uh, yellow two or something like that and then you set that on the right hand dial which his hand is blocking mm. and he's showing it there Now you can see that dial and he's taken the reading and now he's he's setting the dial, the, the number and the color. Now he's tabbed over and he's typing the line again after setting it on that right hand dial. And this time that line is going to come out at the proper length because the machine will insert as much space as needed between the words so that the line comes out even. But that business of tabbing over from the left to the right only works on a small column, uh, like a magazine column. When you're typing yeah. a wide column, like for books, the system's different. You go down the whole page and you tab over and you you set, you, you record your reading, like Y2 would be yellow two or, or B4 would be blue four. Uh, for each line, you do that. Then you go back and retype the entire page. You put you put a, a new sheet in and you retype the page with setting the the, the dial uh, each time. Um, that's how it's, how it was done. It's, 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 it seems like a quite a sophisticated typewriter actually, uh, in terms of spacing and the way you can you know the lines will be even in size. It, it, because we it see was those... very sophisticated, very clever. There's no electronics in it it was all done mechanically um there were you know dials and and so on gears and dials within the machine nothing is electronic there it's electric but not electronic there's no computer no silicon um and and, and yes it's very sophisticated and we had two of these and we were running them 24 hours a day both of them um we were running them around the clock. The we'd have our schedule was that we one person would type from twelve to four. That means from midnight to four a.m. and then again from noon till four o'clock in the afternoon. The next person next shift would be from four to eight a.m. and, and p.m. and then from eight in the evening till midnight and eight in the morning. Uh, till noon. So in that way, we had three shifts and we're running these machines around the clock. Uh, nobody did that. <laughs> we were driving these machines the way, you know, no office does that. Um, back then, IBM used to make its, a fair amount of its income from selling service contracts on these machines. Uh, along with the machine, you would have a service contract. And if anything was, was you had any problem, the serviceman came in and, and fixed it for you. But we had servicemen coming in every other day. <laughs> we were, we were running these machines like slave drivers. Wow. And when we finally retired the machine, the, uh, you know, IBM came and took them away. Maybe they were leased or whatever. And I remember the, 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 uh, the fellow saying, uh, this machine doesn't owe you anything. 
you, you, you utilized it. I, I wonder if the keys had the letters still on it because it was used so much. Um, you know, it, it did have the letters, but I haven't filled you in on on what else was going on. As you know that, or as I mentioned, that ball gets changed every time you change a typeface. That yeah. means that on the word for word meetings, for example, every time you change from italic to Roman and back, you change that ball. Uh... And that's only part of it also, because what about the diacritic marks? So the there was one company in the world which would replace letters on one of these IBM golf balls. And we had them, we would sacrifice characters that we didn't need or didn't need very often and replace them with characters with the diacritical characters. Oh. Um, and there was a, a sort of a, a way to get them in place on, on the, on the page. But it, it I can tell you that it wasn't easy. And when these balls would break a tooth or something from on the bottom, their little teeth that you don't see, mm. uh, we would sometimes keep using them anyway. So we'd have one ball that we'd use just for whatever particular letters were that it, it would give us. Uh, yeah. So what these typesetting devotees uh, went through to to pr put out Prabhupada's books is uh, can only be described, I guess, as heroic. So devotees like Palika Dasi, Mahamaya Dasi, Ragatmika Dasi, the uh, Mamata Dasi, uh, Nari Dasi. There were were um, there was quite a crew there, and they did this this round the clock work, uh, which was you know quite demanding. That's amazing, Raj. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's uh, such a feat. <laughs> it, it, it was it was quite something. And uh, and then there were corrections when there were errors. Things had to be corrected. And this the output of this machine would be. Um, well, you would you would spray it first of all with a toxic fixative, to so that the letters would be solid would would you wouldn't smudge and then we had a team a layout team that would cut those pages up and uh, turn them into actual pages because these are just what we call galleys you know they're just lines and lines and lines of type but they would turn these lines of type into actual pages and there was a, a system with what we call light tables and so on and using rubber cement and later using a waxing machine to put these things in place and then uh, cycles of proofreading and proofreading and proofreading again proofreading and correcting proofreading and correcting it was quite something to turn out uh, those books the 17 books by then we'd switched to a, a photo setting system another mm. technology now obsolete um, and another very expensive machine, by the way. Uh, but that streamlined the process quite considerably. There were no fonts to change and uh, everything was, you, you could really do, uh, do things up. And that's how Prabhupada uh, came up with that marathon. He, he visited the press in Los Angeles. We moved from Tiffany Place in Brooklyn near the Brooklyn Temple to Watsaka Avenue, uh, or actually Venice Boulevard, the, the corner of Watsaka and, and, and Venice on, uh, at, at the New Dwarka community. And when Prabhupada visited, he visited the press. We, had, we uh, had rented a building there and we had everything set up. And then there were some other offices on Watsaka Avenue itself. So everyone was sitting in their place doing their work. And Prabhupada was coming along with Tamal Krishnamaraj and some other devotees and seeing that this devotee is doing this, this devotee is doing that. And he saw the typesetting machine, which was a modern, uh, well, for those days, modern computerized machine with lights flashing and so on. <laughs> and Prabhupada said that in, in India, I was dreaming of something like this. 
And then it was the next morning that Prabhupada said that now that you have all this, you know, such a, a nice arrangement, I think you can complete these 17 books in two months. Wow, Sri Prabhupada has such a vision and he could see it's like it, lean management in these days, you know, when somebody goes in and sees, okay, this is how we can improve it. And he suddenly sees this machine and he's like, this can be possible. And uh, like you said, impossible is in a fool's dictionary, uh, as you mentioned. Yes. Um, <sighs> thank you so much for sharing that in-depth point of view. And like, I think, as you mentioned, a seminar on this and how it was done uh, and all the details uh, would be fantastic. Jade Vaita Swami Maharaj. At yeah, some maybe point. if somebody prods me, I'll do it. Okay, so. we'll make sure. We've had some questions come in. I think uh, we, we made a note and uh, we'll try and put this on here. Wow, we've just had, we just had a message from Indra Jumna Swami. Wow. He says, One of my Dear great Jade Vaita, <laughs> Dear Jade Vaita Swami, thank you for sharing these precious memories of very early days. My question is, during those times when the machinery of book publication in all the amazing aspects was going on, was there a standard morning program for the devotees? Question mark. Did you break regularly for prashadam? Question mark. Were there any preaching programs or was everyone just giving their heart and souls for publications of the books so dear to Srila Prabhupada? Thank you, Marsh, for such an, an excellent question. We had a very strong morning program for all the devotees at the press. The um, When we were in, in Brooklyn, particularly, the, the, we had a really revved up uh, program. The, 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 morning pro the whole morning program was very, very strong, and the devotees would all look forward to taking part in the the morning program and the, and the whole temple program that the temple program in, at Henry Street at that time was uh, marvelous to anyone who was there still raves about it. So we, we did that. We were fully engaged in the morning program before that, when we were in Boston, uh, there was again, very strong temple program led by Satsurup Marsh. All the devotees would take part in the, the temple program. Um, Yes, we would break for prasadam. And while we were in Boston, in fact, Prabhupada, that's kind of when Prabhupada really started the idea that there should be regular Harinam Sankirtan every day. And Prabhupada told the press workers that we should go every day, at least for one hour. So um, before that, devotees would go out on the street, but there it really became like a, a, a focal point of ISKCON's activities to go out every day and to uh, chant Hare Krishna and distribute back to Godheads and so on. So Prabhupada said the press workers should also go at least an hour a day. So we used to jump in our van and uh, zip out to uh, Boston Commons and uh, take part in the, in the kirtan for an hour and then zip back into the van and, and back to work. And we found that uh, invariably going out on kirtan, some kirtan increased our productivity. Uh, the, the amount of junk in your mind that gets driven out, the amount of enthusiasm that you get, you know, far outweighed any so-called loss of time. So all the press workers were there and even be, they'd be in the lead, like Bard Raj, the, the artist would be leading kirtan and all, all the devotees would be there distributing books, distributing back to Godheads, chanting Hare Krishna. It was a mainstay of the, the press program. And that continued into, um, into Brooklyn also. That, that, uh, and, and any other preaching programs, that, that's, that's, that was juice for us. It, it wasn't just office work, but the, the Sunday program, the Sunday fees, preaching to the guests, if there were other preaching programs, all of this was the, the press devotees used to uh, relish taking part in, in all of those activities. At one point, there was a division sort of the press workers who were working on the physical printing press that we had were not so strong. 
on on that. The, the upstairs workers who are doing layout and design and and typesetting and proofreading and editing, we were totally into it. But the people downstairs were not all of them, but some of them were were not very strong. One devotee, Adwaita, who'd really been sort of the founder of the press, was not coming to the morning program. And Prabhupada one time called me, when he came to Brooklyn, he called me into his room. He said, uh, I have heard that Adwaita is not attending the morning program. Is this true? Uh, I hear that they are not attending. Is this true? And, you know, I didn't really want to rat on him, but I had to acknowledge that it was true. Prabhupada said, go over there and tell him to close the press. He said, we do not need this press. If they cannot attend the programs, there is no need. Tell them to close the press. And so I did. I told him, you know, that's what Prabhupada said. And, uh, of course, then they started coming, but it, it, eventually they, they'd stop coming and the press was closed. That part of it didn't continue. When we went to Los Angeles, there was no printing machinery. It was all what we call pre-press, getting things ready for the printer. And so we would, we would send things, to do all the printing outside. But that's how much emphasis Prabhupada gave to, the, to sadhana, to the morning program, to chanting, to all of these things that would keep you strong and inspired in, in Krishna consciousness. And Anandam Bhuti Bhardhanam, that was really the, 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 the engine for, for what we called ISKCON Press back in those days. And even when we went to Los Angeles, during the 17-book marathon, we would go to Mangal Arti, we would chant our rounds, and the rest was just, you know, whatever you had to do. But we, we didn't stop that. We didn't stop Mangal Arti. We didn't stop chanting our rounds. And, of course, we didn't stop taking prasadam. We definitely had prasadam <laughs> breaks for sure. Uh, wow. But that's really what, what kept us going. We... we we and then the Los Angeles Temple program at that time, the kirtan in the evening. We would go in the morning. We would go in the evening. The evening kirtan was like uh, the evening arti was unbelievable. You had Jai Sachinanda and you had Agni Dev. You had these incredible kirtanias, and devotees would just like run to be there. You wouldn't want to miss out. All the Madangas were expert Madanga players, all exactly boom in sync, and just wonderful kirtan. So, and, and beautiful deity worship. So that was the life of, of our, our program, was, was the kirtan and, and um, preaching. And then you hear Thank you so much for that. And now my life is, is uh, your book. <laughs> now, now my life is listening to Indra Dumnamarja's wonderful talks from Vrindavan, where he's visiting the 12 forests. And I've, uh, since I, I discovered that I'm, I'm still keeping up every day with this. Uh, just nectarian Vrindavan Kata, Krishna Kata. <laughs> he's he's saying, Thank you, Maharaj. You are my hero. Uh <laughs> is he he what you are my heroes. Wow. So such loving reciprocation. So nice. Thank you, and Jajumna Swami Maharaj, for that. Uh, and then he's also put, and Rameshwar Prabhu, you are another of my Sankirtan heroes. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. Thank you for this. And there's so many questions that came up. Uh, it's just amazing. And, and I apologize to everybody online. Maybe we'll need to do another session if Maharaj permits. Um, but I've got one question if I can uh, just ask Maharaj. Um, this is from uh, Padma Rani J uh, Nittai Mata Devi Dasi. She says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Pamo. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, so wonderful memories that he took. Oh, not only Srila Prabhupada for giving this Srila spiritual knowledge, but also to you and the devotees for Shila service to Srila Prabhupada. All glories. And there was one question I wanted to bring up, if I can, and that was to do with going forward. Now that we are, I'm just getting that question right now because there's comments coming left, right, and center. Okay, here we go. This is the one. Uh, Lalita Rangadevi, Devi Dasi says, thank you so much for taking us back in time. Your memories are precious. What is your vision for the future of book publication and distribution going forward? 
Hmm. Well, of course, I've retired from the BBT. And so it's, you know, my vision doesn't count all that much. It's really the vision of the, the BBT trustees and the, the, the leaders of, of ISCON, what, what vision they want to have. Um, th this is a seminar in itself, you know, what, what, would you, what do you envision as, as the future? There's so much that can be done uh, to up-level book production and, and book distribution. There's, uh, and also, by the way, I would think of it, one thing I can say, that there's ways to increase both, but one thing I can say is that our, that publishing a book and distributing the book is, it should really be the beginning. It's not that once the book is, is in someone's hands, that's sort of it and we, 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 our work is done. We have this sort of time bomb metaphor where we, we chuck all these hand grenades and wait for them to explode sometime later. And, and we see that that does happen. But uh, one might think that, that it would make sense to follow up with people and not just wait for, for something to manifest in their, their minds or hearts, but to cultivate uh, step by step their further involvement you got this book. What about that book? You you got this book. What about this seminar? You what you went? You got this. What about this retreat? So there's so many. You, you got this. What about what about beads? What about so many things? So I would envision book publication and book distribution as part of a larger process and a larger vision, not just the act of of uh, printing a book and then delivering it into someone's hands, but a integrated uh, effort to bring people back to into the process of Krishna consciousness and ultimately bring them back to Godhead. That's where I see lots of room for intelligent and carefully thought, up, thought, up, thought through um, planning and, and uh, strategy and execution. Yeah, uh, make it part of a, a much larger thing involving uh, online resources, temple resources, uh, you know, there, there, there's, you know, whatever technology may come up with, uh, telephones, you know, if they're, they're not out of date yet, you can still talk <laughs> to people. And, you know, there's a, you know, just, did you read the book? What did you think? Da, 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 da. So every every by every means that's available and practical to keep touch with the people who've who've received our books and encourage them appropriately so that they can make further progress, further progress, further progress. Thank you so much for sharing, Marge. And I'll finish final comment because it's a really nice uh, thing from Robert Grant. He's put as on here. Rameshar Prabhu. Ramesh Prabhu. Um, he said, Hare Krishna, Pamho, all glories to Shilapur. Thank you, Maharaj, for these priceless memories, which are like rivers of nectar. During the CC marathon, I asked Shila Prabhupada, what category of devotional service are the press devotees engaged in? His divine grace said, while working, I, I production of the books that the duty, uh, that his, is the deity worship. And once the books in printer, the service then becomes Shravanam Kirtanam. He once again told us that his books are no different from the deities, non different from Krishna himself. Jai. <laughs> it's been amazing. Uh, absolutely amazing. Thank you, Ramesh Prabhu, for joining. Thank you, Indra Jumna Swami Maharaj, for joining. And thank you, Jade Vaita Swami Maharaj, for this amazing. You know, Shila Prabhupada and his books for our Prabhupada memoirs. And before we go, finally, of course, talking of books, how can we not bring up the point about Vanity Karma, a book by yourself, Jade Vaita Swami Maharaj? Please, could you um, let the audience that are coming on uh, about this book and, uh, and where we can get it? Uh, very briefly, it's a. It's, I, I envision the book as, well, 
the, the book is a, is a, is a well, concerns really the meaning of life. And the, the real topic is how is living even worth it? That's the actual theme of the book. It's a commentary on a biblical book, which raises that very question and suggests that perhaps life has no meaning whatsoever. Uh, so it's a very unusual book to be in the Bible. And this is a, uh, a commentary on that whole book. I believe it's the first Hindu, you would say, commentary, full-length Hindu commentary on any book of the Bible. Uh, the, I, I see it as a bridge book and one that doesn't hold back. It doesn't, it's meant to, to reach out to a, a Western audience, to a, a completely uninformed audience that doesn't know anything about Krishna and basically present all the headlines of our philosophy uh, from you're not this body to Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Life is not meant for sense gratification. Surrender to Krishna, perform pure devotional service, chant Hare Krishna, the whole, uh, the whole business is there. So the, yes. So I, I, I envision it as, or I, I see it as being in some ways following in the footsteps of Isha Upanishad. Isha Upanishad in, his, in one book gives you a, 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 a wonderful uh, presentation of the whole philosophy. So I tried to follow in Srila Prabhupada's footsteps. So Vanity Karma tries to do that also. And I, I, I would say sort of from a, a Westerner's point of view, there's, I've kept the Sanskrit way down. I've, unfamiliar terms are not used or they're explained. So it, in that sense, it's a, a bridge book. It also follows Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada, you, you might remember, uh, envisioned a, a, a series of um, books discussing Western philosophy from a Krishna conscious point of view. So the, the speaker of, of this biblical book is, is a philosopher, and th my book speaks to, uh, speaks with, and speaks to his his thoughts. So in that way, also I try to follow in Srila Prabhupada's footsteps. So I think it's it's a very accessible book for 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 new people, and especially I would say for people who think. If if you're looking for uh, you know uh, bright, happy, smiling faces, and uh, you know men and wife, uh, uh, a husband and wife hugging with their little kid in the middle, find another book. This isn't it. <laughs> um, but for people who are, who are thoughtful, who are, who are thinking, who are con you know, perhaps perplexed or distressed about what life is all about, why miseries keep coming upon us, uh, why the, what we want is always somehow two steps ahead of us, uh, for a thoughtful person, that's that's our our target thank you so much so everyone get your hands on this book there'll be friends and family and yourself that would be good for us like you said bridge wasn't it maraj you mentioned the bridge, bridge aspect from from bbt or your local temple or amazon amazon it, yeah. it's also um an ebook whether you have epub or or uh amazon so Amazon or, or Google Play or, or Barnes & Noble, they all have it. Just put it on Google search and you'll find it. Uh, there it is, yes. Vanity Karma. And there's so many ways. So please do check it out. And thank you so much, His Holiness Jared Vaita Swami Maharaj, for today coming on, spending you know, your valuable time and, and sharing such in-depth about Srila Prabhupada and his books and the process. It's just such a bonus learning so much from you. And we pray that we can have you on at a later stage uh, at some point, uh, because this was just fantastic. And thank you for your time. Hare thank you, Jagannath Kirtan Ananda. Thank you to Ramishar Prabhu and Indra Dumna Maharaj and all the devotees. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna.